Good. All right, great. Thanks, everybody, uh, for being here today and for inviting me to present. I've uh, been looking forward to you. Uh, giving you an overview of uh, mostly one particular project that we just wrapped up with the Water Reach Research Foundation. Um, adapting an approach called HACCP, or the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point Approach, to um, wastewater recycling. So we're just talking about groundwater and stormwater capture and recycling. Now we're moving into uh, potable reuse or wastewater recycling. So what I'm going to do is start off with a couple of definitions, give you an overview of what's happening around the U.S., and we're going to talk about some of our project um, outcomes and how this can be applied to potable reuse projects. So just definitionally speaking, uh, when we're talking about potable reuse, we're talking about uh, extracting water out of wastewater uh, through some sort of advanced treatment process. And oftentimes we talk about indirect versus direct potable reuse. So indirect potable reuse would be where we would drop it into some sort of environmental buffer, whether that's a, a reservoir or a spreading basin, or we directly inject it into the ground. That water then sits there for a set period of time, and it's later uh, extracted and uh, moves to drinking water treatment and is returned to the city for urban uh, consumption uh, as drinking water. When we move from indirect potable reefs to direct potable reefs, what we're doing is essentially eliminating the environmental buffer. So now we've still got the advanced treatment. There are a number of different technologies that can be used to get us there, whether it's a reverse osmosis membrane-based treatment or an ozone biofiltration treatment. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, but what we do is we get rid of that environmental buffer and we put in engineered storage. So that water is in uh, detained in some sort of tank or reservoir for a certain period of time. And then is later uh, uh, treated uh, at a drinking water treatment plant, or in some cases goes direct to the distribution system without any further treatment. And so, as a lot of people start to think about this, they, they get nervous, they get to think back, and they start to say, well, how do we know it's safe? How do we ensure that uh, the facility that you have in place and the operators that you train know what they're doing? How do they know to how to respond to events? So that's what this project has really been about, is getting those systems in place and adapting them for uh, use in Reuse. Um, so first of all, I do want to say that potable reuse, while it's, it's new in some places in the U.S., it's not particularly new um, around the world. The oldest direct potable reuse plant that is going uh, not through a second drink water treatment plant, but direct distribution, is in uh, Vento, Namibia. They've been doing it since 1968. Uh, the plant was upgraded around 2000 or so. Um, I've been there, toured the plant, drank the water. It's, it's great. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a really great success story. And, and clearly, um, they have a very dry environment, but they're in a desert, and they needed this water resource. Uh, in Southern California, um, one of the oldest systems in the US, this is uh, indirect potable reuse, groundwater recharge. It was started in the 70s with the uh, Water Factory 21, um, and later uh, was upgraded into what they call the GWRS, or the Groundwater Recharge System, which is a series of different uh, ways of injecting and spreading water to protect from seawater intrusion and provide a resource. A really interesting fact about this system, uh, many of you think of reverse osmosis membranes as seawater desalination uh, or fractured water desalination processes. Actually, the very first application in the world of reverse osmosis membranes was for potable reuse. It was the uh, Water Factory 21, uh, and that was two years before the first uh, RO10. And then in the US, we have uh, two systems which Fortunately and unfortunately, they're not working anymore. Uh, that they, uh, they could work, but they're not in use because Texas had rain and ended the drought, and so they weren't really needing to go this advanced uh, treatment route. But, but Wichita Falls and Big Spring, Texas had operating direct political reuse systems that were feeding water to their communities during uh, periods of drought. So clearly not new. Uh, there, there are other case stories I could uh, talk about, but those are a few just to give you an overview. Um, In. The laser point is working, but the somebody uh, flips slides, slides forward. It's uh, again, the laser pointer seems to work, so it's not a battery. Um, and I'll just have to uh, talk through this. So, what I've got here is a map of reuse in the United States, and, and the purple states are the non political reuse, uh, typically, but we've also got a number of states that are. Uh, currently allow indirect potable reuse, uh, direct potable reuse, and or are migrating towards indirect or direct potable reuse regulations. Um, and, and, oops. Um, 
So it's color coded here. Um, interestingly, North Carolina just passed some legislation uh, allowing direct quote for reuse. But uh, as we found out when we started to talk to the regulators, they're going, yeah, it's allowed, but we don't have any idea what to do. So while we're moving forward in terms of legislation, we don't always have regulation. It's not always a clear path forward on how exactly we implement these systems, how we permit them, uh, how we design and operate them. Okay, well, this is working again. That's, that's good. Or, or somebody's very astute clicker ahead for me. Um, so the theme here in the rest of the presentation is really um, about building trust and confidence in, in direct quote for use. How do we ensure that the systems that we have uh, are working properly? And what we're doing is, is uh, outlining a process here that allows you to assess the risks, uh, identify the critical control points that are going to be used, uh, validate those, and set limits, validate the monitors that are used to ensure that the variables are working properly, um, and develop response procedures. procedures. And at the heart of that is your operations team, so making sure that they're ready um, to go with the TPR. So we're really talking about raising this case. We're, we're taking out the environmental buffer. We're going straight into distribution systems and drinking water plants. We're raising the stakes here. And so we have two projects. Um, I'm really only going to talk about this one on the left, the uh, critical control points. That's evaluating how you trust the technology. But we're also looking at how we trust operations. What are those things that we need to have in place to, uh, to, to make sure that they're prepared? So let me give you a brief introduction to the HACCP methodology, again, HACCP analysis and critical control points. Uh, this was a methodology that was developed in the 1960s as a collaboration between NASA and Pillsbury. And the goal of this was to ensure that all of the processes being used to develop the food products that are going up on space missions were free of contamination. The last thing you wanted to have happen was that one of your astronauts gets dysentery while they're out in space. So this was really a systematic approach to evaluate every possible risk that could happen in the food production line and making sure that those risks are controlled at the point of, of, um, of whatever process it is, rather than focusing on into the pipe testing or trying to figure out whether your food is actually met um, those, those uh, safety parameters by opening up the package and testing it. So it's really focusing on production steps along the way, not the final product. That way you ensure that, that you're producing right quality as you go, you're not as worried about what happens at the end of the time. So critical control points, this is a, a term that we're seeing more and more come up in projects, but it's really important to define it. And, and I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but it's, it's so critical that you understand two things. First of all, critical control points are specifically designed to reduce, prevent, or eliminate a human health hazard. So we're talking specifically about human health, not asset management not production of the facility. The other thing that a critical control point has to have is a control mechanism. You have to be able to turn a dial, change a dose, change the flow rate. You've got to be able to do something to that process. So a passive process that doesn't allow you to actually change what it's doing is not a critical control point. You've got to be a barrier for human health risk, and you've got to be able to control that barrier. Those are two really important things. So in this example here, uh, we've got reverse osmosis membranes. The critical control point here um, is the barrier itself. The monitor, uh, a lot of people get confused and say, well, the monitor is critical too. Well, it is, but that's not the critical control point. The monitor simply tells you that the barrier is intact, excuse me, intact and is doing what it's supposed to do. So, uh, again, really important distinction there. Uh, the other thing about this is that we end up with uh, set points, um, and, and I'll talk about these a bit more uh, in a, a bit more detail, but you've got alarms which or alerts, excuse me, to tell you, hey, something in the process is uh, getting towards a, a limit. We need to pay attention to this, see what's happening. And then uh, there's actually a critical alarm which triggers an immediate shutdown. So uh, it's also important to have both of those uh, pieces in place. So what does this methodology uh, provide for us? It's, it's, a, it's a, a logical, uh, scientific way of reviewing and managing risks to protect public health. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a methodology, so there's not a single answer. Um, it's applicable to many different types of systems. So you may be looking at just a few processes and groundwater injection. You may be looking at a very complex treatment train. This methodology lets you go through and ask, yourselves a lot of, ask yourself a lot of questions. So what are the risks you're trying to manage? What are the right technologies that you need to manage those risks for the system? Uh, how do you ensure that those technologies are working? And how do you respond to that barrier so as to fail? And again, the focus is on health-relevant 
management, not asset management, not uh, production. So those do come into the picture at some point. So there's a, there's a flow chart to, that you can use to go through and figure out uh, whether a particular process is a critical control point. Um, and, and it boils down to three basic questions. Well, there are more questions up here. Um, again, is there a hazard of a step? Um, can it be controlled by a step in the process? And is that step particularly intended to eliminate or reduce the risk? So a great example of a non-critical control point would be a bar screen in the wastewater treatment plant. Okay, if you were to drink the water coming out of the back end of the bar screen, would there be a human health threat? Absolutely. Right? But is that bar screen meant to reduce that threat? No, it's not there for pathogen reduction, it's not there for chemical reduction. It's there to take out solids from coming into the wastewater treatment plant. So from that perspective, it's critical for operations, and we call it a critical operating point, but it's not critical for public health protection. So there are seven principles that are applied uh, universally in HACCP projects, uh, and, and I'll talk about how they're applied here in direct political reuse. Um, and I'll go through some steps, but again, it's looking at the hazard analysis, determining your critical control points, establishing critical limits, establishing a system to monitor, and then these last uh, three steps, while they're all extremely important, I'm going to lump them together uh, in operations, essentially, and I'll shorten that up today. So, uh, when we were starting this project, a lot of people kept asking me, well, that, that's great. HACCP is great for the direct global reuse, the advanced water treatment facility, but does it apply to everything in the system? And in reality, it does, because you have to ask yourself, what are all the particular risks that I have? So, you, you apply this HACCP methodology all the way from conventional source water monitoring, because let's say you're a DPR facility, you've decided to produce public uh, direct public reuse water for your community, and there's a chemical spill in the river, suddenly your distribution system is contaminated, and now everybody says, well, that's because you have this DPR plant. Well, it's not. You've got to manage the risks in your source water just as much as you've got to manage the risks in your DPR facility. Likewise, if you have a taste and odor event, where are people going to think that taste and odor is coming from? It's not from the river. It's clearly got to be from the wastewater, right? So you've got to be able to manage that as well. So we start with conventional source monitoring. We look at industrial treat treatment programs and surveillance. How do we ensure that the uh, big industries throughout our collection system are uh, treating their waste and not dumping a bunch of mercury or cadmium or zinc or uh, other organic chemicals in there? Um, how do we uh, manage these from an operations perspective? How do we respond to events? How do we manage the assets to, to ensure reliable functioning? Um, another really key piece is looking at interfaces. Oftentimes, there may be multiple entities handling the wastewater side versus the treatment water side. Anytime that there's a handoff of water from one entity to the next, you've got to make sure that you've got some methodology for communicating, or at least ensuring that the water coming between those interfaces meets some quality objectives. Then you have your critical control points themselves. So what can you control at your drinking water plant, your wastewater plant, and at the direct local reuse facility? And then lastly, you've got to be able to monitor your potable distribution. So you've got lead, copper, THMs, HAAs, um, other contaminants out there, and to make sure you're compliant. So essentially, HACCP applies to everything within that system. It's a web of really identifying and assessing those risks and making sure that you're controlled. So let's take a look at implementing them. So this is one particular type of potable reuse treatment train, uh, where we've got uh, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, UV advanced oxidation, uh, and chlorine contact. And I'll talk a little bit about these uh, as, as to how we get through um, uh, identifying those critical control points. But before you go there, you've actually got to ask yourself, what are the risks you're trying to control? If you have no idea, you're just going to start throwing stuff at it and you suddenly get a very expensive system where you're trying to manage all these unknowns. So when we do a hazard analysis, we look at the collection system, um, we look at what kind of industries are there, um, we try to uh, do a, a source water characterization. So what is the, the chemical composition of the wastewater coming in or out of your uh, wastewater treatment facility? So you identify the contaminants, you identify the types of events that might occur, um, when you can identify the source of the contaminants, and you end up with a risk register that, that uh, evaluates on a semi-quantitative basis what are your risks and how can you control them. Uh, and identifying hazardous events is a great place. People say, well, what about, what about contaminant X? What about contaminant Y? What about, you know, hexamethyl death? I don't know. Whatever the contaminants you're concerned, throw it in this. Put it in this risk register. I don't care what you do. Pick your worst possible nightmare. Throw it in here. And then what you do is you start asking yourself a series of very pointed questions. 
say it's that nightmare really going to be a reality? And if it is, we need to put something in place to control for it. And if not, we move it out of the risk register. So we look at things like accidental contaminant catchment system, um, formation of disinfection byproducts, you know, catastrophic uh, integrity breaches of the plant. All of those things go into this risk register, and there's a great process for evaluating those. Um, and then you end up with um, really looking through this for particular contaminants. Um, what's the likelihood that they're going to be there? Um, what's the risk if you didn't treat for it? And then once you apply your various barriers, have you uh, managed that particular contaminant or, uh, or risk? So uh, again, there's, there's a lot of information in this, but I just want to tell you that it's a, a specific process to really help you um, go through and evaluate those. Then once you evaluate your contaminant, now you've got a target. Now you've got something to look for um, and try to, uh, to manage. So taking a look here at this uh, same process train, what are our critical control points? Well, microfiltration is there. You get some microorganism removal across that process. Um, reverse osmosis, you get some, again, microorganism removal and uh, chemical contaminant removal. UV advanced oxidation is primarily there uh, for chemicals of concern, but you also get a great deal of disinfection across it. Chlorine, obviously, is there for uh, pathogens. But there are a couple of other critical control points that are important as well. This chloramine dosing point up front is really meant to control biofouling of your microfiltration membrane and your RO membrane. But if you don't do it correctly, you end up forming disinfection byproducts. DHMs, HAAs, and also uh, this one here, NDMA and nitrosodimethylamine. So that becomes a critical control point, not because you're actually removing a hazard, but because you potentially are adding one in that process. Likewise, uh, stabilization, um, when you send a highly treated RO permeate out of distribution, if you hadn't if you haven't added some way of stabilizing it, you can end up releasing lead and copper out of the distribution. Um, and, and anytime you do that, when you change water supplies, read Lead Michigan, um, suddenly you've got a serious issue on your hands. So now, while again, we're not controlling the hazard of the plant, this is doing something that prevents a hazard from occurring out of the distribution system. So it becomes a critical control point. The interesting thing, though, is that when we think of these, the primary process function isn't necessarily the same as a critical control point. So, for the um, chloramines, like I said, it is there for membrane biofouling control. Microfiltration, it, it, its primary purpose is to keep your RO membrane safe. That's why it's there. RO membranes are there for desalting, so salinity management strategy, not a disinfection strategy, not a, a, a chemical removal strategy. Um, UV advanced oxidation, really, it was, it was put in place to control for NDMA and another contaminant, one for toxin. So it's chemicals of concern, and stabilization is there for protecting your distribution system assets. So some, some different ways of looking at this, but again, they still become uh, really important parts of the process. Let's look at uh, critical limits and monitoring. Uh, I talked about this already, I won't spend much time here, but it is really important that we have limits that we understand uh, how each particular process is responding, what's, uh, what's, what we do when it goes wrong. Um, and, and one of the steps here is that you determine your monitoring needs. For each process step, you ask yourself, what are the monitors, the analyzers that I need to have in place to ensure it's working properly? So, for example, reverse osmosis, you may need electrical conductivity and online TOC measures. So, again, no need to spend a lot of time on here, just to know that there's a methodology in place to, uh, to organize and think about those particular monitors. So, once you've done that, now you've got to actually think about operating the facility. Um, and so it's all about corrective actions and responses. So our systems are really highly automated. Um, we rely very heavily on um, the, the monitors that are out there, the, the switches, the pumps, the valves, to do what they're supposed to do. All of that information is then taken up into a SCADA communication and the operator then interfaces with it. And we've got to think about, well, what are the alerts when we have to take action but not necessarily shut down versus what are the critical things? We get a certain alarm that says, hey, there's some of the back going on, we need to shut down right now. Uh, and that's a really important thing to parse out. The other piece of this automation that's often uh, not really thought about is how heavily we rely on the analyzers. So the risk of failure here, we've done a lot of analysis and I'm not talking about the details of it, but the risk of failure is not so much the process. The processes are actually really good at doing what they're supposed to do. The risk is that the analyzer fails and either tells you you've got too high a rating, too low a rating, or the worst case, the analyzer fails to notice that the uh, process isn't working. So now you start thinking about double validation and triple validation of your monitors. And from an operations perspective, you got to make sure your guys are out there in the field calibrating these, testing these, double checking to make sure that they're telling uh, uh, folks in the control room that the number that they're saying is the real number. 
Once you have that, then we have to deal with uh, response procedures. So you've got normal operations, some sort of alerts triggered. Now you start to verify your instrumentation, review the trends, validate, um, and then what do you do with that alert? You know, so we've, uh, in this report, um, we've actually gone through for every possible DPR process and identified a specific chain of correction actions for an alert level, and then also work for critical harm. So this is where the shutdown occurs. So for an alert, you saw that there was verify, check it out, make sure it's okay. Critical, there's no question. The immediate step is to shut down. And that's an automated response. Then you go through and start asking yourself, well, is this a real uh, thing or not? So it's, it's really important that in DPR, if you have a critical alert, the first thing that happens is it shuts down, and then you start to uh, investigate what's going on. So uh, last slide here, uh, in terms of uh, integrating critical control points, this is really a great methodology to go through. It's, it's transparent. Um, it engages regulators. If you, if you take this kind of methodology, you bring the regulators in early. Um, we found that they love to talk with you about um, how these systems work, why you made these choices, what risks are you really trying to manage. Um, it, the, the data that I didn't really talk about is, is operating data, but there is a tremendous amount of redundancy and reliability in the system. You can huge amount of disinfection and chemical removal relative even to what's uh, accredited. Um, the most important thing, again, is that you're protecting public health. Asset management is really important. It is a part of this, but when we're thinking of critical control points, the number one thing that we have to do is manage and prevent that public health threats. Um, provides a lot of confidence to regulators, and it really provides clarity on how to respond when alerts and alarms can happen. So a bunch of acknowledgements here, uh, folks at Hazen Sawyer, Water Reeves Research Foundation, uh, Primary University of New South Wales, uh, and, and another guy in uh, Australia, um, Head Start Development, uh, Separation Process Incorporated, and then a number of utility partners who provided data. Uh, I do want to say that uh, we finished the report, there's, there's a ton of information in there. Uh, the final draft is in the foundation, so it should be published and available soon. But if anybody's interested in uh, any of the data, I can give you so with that, I will stop and uh, answer your questions. <coughs> Thank you. Questions? No concerns? No. What do you do about contaminants next? <laughs> <laughs> what has been your, your interaction with the regulated community? I mean, are there any exceptions? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, not, not universally, but when we uh, presented this approach, uh, the regulators really like it because, again, you're inviting them early. You're not saying, hey, we've developed this project and look what we've done. I hear it, permit this. Uh, you're saying, why don't you come in right now when we're starting to even think about what processes there are? Um, we want you there with us. We want you talking with us. We want you buying into this process. Um, but, but it gives a, a really nice, clear, way of documenting all of your decisions. And the thing that I didn't mention is that that risk register document that's got the, the contaminants, the risk, the likelihood of treatment, it becomes a living document. So when a new contaminant does come around, you then modify it and you ask yourself, well, do my treatment barriers work or do I need to add something? Uh, so I found that they really like that. We worked very closely with um, one of the Texas regulators who um, uh, permitted the two DPR products there, and she was really on board and a California Department of uh, Drinking Water has really been on board with this methodology as well. And later today, we'll have a bunch of questions. Yeah, Dr. Stanford, I can tell you exactly what's going on. I'm about to describe what we come from. We brought the regulators in early because they don't understand what it takes to run a water treatment plant. Right? All they see is data. And when they see a blip in that data, they don't understand that an air bubble got trapped in the Bitimeter and caused that one spike and it came right back down. Yep. When you bring them into the plant with you and show them how you operate, show them how you probe RO membranes for failures, it opens their eyes. Yeah. And that is critical to bring exactly. that early. And, and Marla Berg, who was yeah. involved, she, she's talked a lot about the project and said it's just great having you being involved in that. Analysis and, and uh, investigation. 
irrigation that goes into the, the drinking water supply system and the wastewater collection system. The people that, that uh, instituted that type of program or that learned all of these, is that a big change to how they're operating their system? Um, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, clearly for drinking water systems, there's a lot of monitoring that occurs in terms of quarterly sampling out the distribution system, um, uh, daily sampling within the plant. I think um, one of the biggest paradigm shifts is if, if you've got your wastewater operators that are starting to operate advanced treatment facilities for drinking water production, you're moving from a paradigm of monthly averages to instantaneous needs. And, and so, one of the reasons that we have to have monitors in place, we don't put the analyzer in the water to look for virus. What we do is we put the analyzer in the water to make sure that the process before is working as intended. And so if we've identified that, say, RO membranes remove salinity and you're looking for salinity removal, when they do that, they're also removing all these other things. And so it is a, it is a shift in thinking. Um, it's a shift in understanding what the analyzer is doing. It's not telling you that uh, that there's something there or not there in your water, it's telling you whether your, your barrier is working properly. And so it, it's a new way of thinking about monitoring, it's a new way of thinking about analyzing samples and understanding that monthly averages don't work. Um, you brought up a good point about the wastewater collection system. Um, and I think that's something that we Yeah, and you bring up a, a really interesting and difficult point, which is what methodology do we use to train our operators? Because they've got to understand the wastewater operation. They've got to understand that ammonia changes, that nitrate changes diagonally across the plant. They've got to understand how those processes work. But they've also got to be thinking about what's happening at the recycling facility, what's happening at the drinkwater plant, and what's happening at the distribution system. And so part of that second project about trusting the operators it's about developing the curriculum that's needed to train. And, and where do we draw from? Do we draw from our wastewater operators? Do we draw from drinking water operators? Or both together? Ultimately, you have to meet drinking water uh, regulations, but the wastewater operators have a tremendous skill set that, that's really important. So what we're seeing is there's probably going to be a plan of the two. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, it, it wasn't really a question. It was just a comment. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Last question. <laughs> He's still there. That's just a logo. We're still using the <laughs> Good question. Just a logo. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you all for your attention. Thank you.